All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to CSIS. My name is Sarah Ladislaw. I am the director of the Energy and National Security Program, and we are very pleased to have all of you here today um, for the official report launch of two projects, um, two sort of uh, reports that we did under the Energy in America banner uh, a project that we've been doing for the last several years. Um, the two reports that we're going to talk about today uh, are the changing role of energy in the U.S. economy and energy as a source of economic and social mobility. We are really grateful to the Sloan Foundation for um, providing the funding for this part of the Energy in America series. For those of you who aren't familiar, um, we've been working on this series, Energy in America, for the last uh, three years. It was something we created in, uh, in uh, 2016 16, largely as a reflection of what we'd been observing for the past decade or more, the massive sort of transformational changes that we were seeing take place in the energy system in the United States, both a, a rapid increase in oil and gas production, but also some pretty fundamental changes on the electric power side of the equation, and really an appreciation for the fact that we needed to have a better understanding of how that impacts not only sort of national level uh, economics and geopolitics, which we spend a lot of time thinking about here at CSIS, but also the way in which it was reshaping uh, and changing local economies uh, throughout the United States and what the policy implications were for that. Um, so we're really pleased that you guys could be here today uh, for a discussion from some of the, with some of the contributing authors uh, to the report. Um, what we're going to do this morning is I am uh, going to give an overview of some of the key findings in the first report and frame uh, the second report that's come out, and then we'll have a discussion um, with some of the major contributors uh, to uh, to those re those reports and some of the areas that we think are going to be particularly salient for energy policy conversations going forward. Um, but. I want to introduce some of my colleagues. Um, first, we've got Joseph Aldi, who is an associate professor of public policy at the John F. Kennedy School at the, uh, uh, excuse me, John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University, and he's also a senior advisor here at the at CSIS, uh, the Energy Program. And then David Hart, uh, over on the end, is a senior fellow at the Information Technology and Innovation Found Foundation (ITF). Uh, and a professor of public policy at uh, George Mason's uh, Center for Science, Technology, Innovation Policy. Um, and then uh, finally, Mary Alice McCarthy, uh, who is the director of the Center on Education and Skills uh, with the Education po uh, Policy Program at New America. Um, we have a lot of people that I'd like to thank uh, for this project, many of whom contributed research uh, uh, to this endeavor. This has been one of my favorite things that we've done here at CSIS in the Energy Program because it's actually brought together a fairly diverse array of experts um, to contribute to this work. It's an area that's a little bit beyond what we've done in the past, um, really thinking about a whole host of things from economic development policy at a local level, thinking about innovation policy, policy in new ways, education policy, worker retraining programs. Um, and what it really has sort of uh, exemplified, for, for me at least, is the way in which the exercise of thinking about energy policy making for energy policy makers has become much, much more complex. And we'll talk a little bit about how and why that is the case. Um, just to get started, why did we do the Energy in America uh, project? I, I mentioned to you earlier, you know, energy is often uh, considered a derivative policy, right? The, the job of energy policy over much of its history has been to create affordable and reliable energy supplies. And we've typically thought about this at a macro level at the United States in terms of being able to provide cheap and affordable energy at relatively, uh, um, uh, with relatively benign sort of environmental impacts of improving over time. Um, but then also in a way that provides energy security, the context for the United States for much of it has, its history has been the fact that we felt we were a growing energy consumer, our energy production was, uh, was declining, we felt energy scarce, we needed to be able to provide those resources. So energy security was often a mantra that was connected to energy policy objectives. Um, 
we we've noticed that in the in 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 the last of several years we have not only sort of changed the energy posture of the United States we are positioned to be a net energy exporter of energy uh, going into the future um, but also our energy policy challenges have changed um, the most fundamental of those is the decarbonization of the energy system for the purposes of combating climate change a not sort of inconsequential thing um, that one might need to do to the energy system to be able to tackle that challenge the second piece here, and this is sort of um, an anecdotal representation of how we see this happening, but I've noticed over the last several election cycles, regardless of policy, regardless of, of political party, um, the role that energy plays in being a source of economic uh, strength, of growth, of job creation, has really uh, carried a lot of political salience, right? This idea that we create jobs through energy investment or that we um, have economic future, uh, an economic future that is attached to energy investment. And what we wanted to do was sort of investigate how and why uh, that was true, and whether or not those were factors that related to energy policy mechanisms versus other uh, other areas of economic policy development. Um, we had two goals uh, fundamentally with this project, and one is to really you know familiarize policymakers with some of the relationship between the changing role of energy in the United States economy, not only at a national level, but also how it affected state and local level economies as well. And then two, identify for those in the sort of academic community, places or the policy development community as well, places where we need additional research, places where we should be looking if we really want energy policy to satisfy some of the needs of, uh, of, of, uh, of meeting economic inequality issues, social mobility issues, how does energy sort of feed into some of those dynamics and what can we contribute to that? As I mentioned, um, these two papers are, are the result of uh, 16 commissioned papers that we, uh, we, we sought out from experts in the field, um, four days of debate uh, and deliberation around those issues, and consultation with about 93 different experts from a diverse range uh, of communities uh, to inform this research. I will say this is the hardest we've ever worked for the least conclusive outcomes, and that is not... <laughs> A criticism. It is what we hope is identifying places where policymakers really do need to think much harder about if they want to derive certain outcomes from energy or economic policy, how effective are we at actually getting some of those outcomes? And we'll go into greater detail of that in just a bit. So starting very quickly with Energy in America, the first of these papers, which is really the look at how energy is changing uh, in, in the sort of context of, uh, of the US economy at a national level, but also at a state and local level. We, um, we uh, basically looked at a couple of different things. One is what has the historical role of energy been in the US economy and how is that changing? And then the second is what are the distributive impacts and implications for different things uh, like an innovation policy or the impacts of climate change and how should those be taken into consideration when we think about uh, the role of energy in the US economy. And again, we asked two overarching questions. Uh, one, how do we prioritize, uh, uh, excuse me, how, what should research community pr prioritize to advance our understanding of the changing role of energy? And two, what should policymakers better appreciate about the changing role of energy in the US economy? And we divided the outcomes or the, the sort of key takeaway messages here into three buckets. One, um, oil and natural gas development, particularly because there's such a, 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 a monumental surge in the production of both of those resources. Um, two, competitiveness and innovation. Uh, and then three, systems transformation and policy impacts and looking at how that uh, transforms uh, uh, the sort of energy system going forward, particularly in the case of uh, an opportunity where we want to tackle climate change and we need to make big changes to the energy system. What are the, some of the things um, that are entailed there? Um, we have 13 different propositions uh, which represent the emerging energy issues that policymakers might not be aware of but ought to be. And I'm going to go through those relatively quickly. Each one of these has multiple papers underneath them and a lot of discussion. So I won't be able to get into sort of the full breadth of everything that's in each one of these takeaways. but did want to sort of leave you with some of them and, and hopefully it'll entice you to engage in the report and some of the subpapers even further. 
Um, the first one is that the performance of the U.S. economy, and this is in the oil and natural gas development side, the, the performance of the U.S. economy is less influenced by changes in the price of oil than it historically has been. And part of this is because when you have an oil price impact, say oil prices uh, go up, traditionally in a, it, the, the portion that was affected in the U.S. economy was the consumer side, which would, um, uh, which would take an impact from the higher price of oil. Now we see that that you also get sort of the impact on the oil production side of the equation, which is higher investment in the oil side of the equation that sort of makes the impact of oil prices in the U.S. economy uh, a, a little bit more muted. Um, there's also um, a, a debate about sort of the changing nature of the U.S. economy and the role of oil and, and gas in the U.S. economy um, as, as, as one of the other factors that sort of uh, decreases the relationship between um, the, the, the impact of oil prices and the overall effect of the, the U.S. economy. Second, domestic oil and uh, gas production does not insulate domestic producers and consumers from international energy price developments. This is a really important message, particularly as we're talking about energy, uh, energy supply disruptions in the Strait of Hormuz um, and other geopolitical impacts. The U.S. is not insulated from these things, particularly on an oil basis. This is not always true, but it is over, over, overall it is true. So, for example, when we've seen the U.S. not be able to export crude oil or, or other particular instances where infrastructure has lagged, there can be disconnects between um, oil prices domestically and internationally. But as a general rule, the U.S. is not any more insulated from oil supply disruptions internationally um, than we have been in the past. Um, the third proposition is that governments at the state and local level frequently lack, to, lack or fail to employ mechanisms to manage the cyclical extremes of energy development. This is particularly true of the oil and gas uh, uh, development communities. Uh, we found both on sort of the, um, the boom part of the oil development cycle and the bust part of the oil development cycle, communities that are particularly reliant on oil-derived revenues, oil and gas-derived revenues, don't necessarily do a very good job of keeping up with the pace of extreme amounts of development, and then also uh, don't necessarily plan for a time when that revenue is not present. There are mechanisms to do that better, um, but the, the more important oil and gas uh, derived revenue becomes uh, in, in, um, in certain local communities, the more important it is for policymakers uh, at the state and local level to think about how to insulate themselves from the boom-bust cycle uh, in particular. Um, and then finally, energy exports have helped to lower the U.S. trade deficit, but probably won't be able to make many further contributions. Um, we have we have achieved the gains from importing less energy, not necessarily uh, export and, and exporting more. The share, though, uh, of of the sort of decline in the in the in the trade uh, balance has been made up by other goods. And so, for those folks who are particularly interested in thinking about trade balances as a meaningful metric of uh, of the U.S. economy and U.S. Uh, U.S. economic uh, growth and productivity, which we take on, uh, issue with in the paper, um, there's not a lot lot more gains to be made from this in an overall trade balance sense from the United States. Secondly, on the competitiveness and innovation side of the equation, we've got four uh, different, uh, five different propositions. Um, the first is that domestic energy markets will be increasingly influenced by policies abroad. Um, part of this is because even on the uh, oil and gas export side of the equation, we are not a marketer of those fuels and thinking a lot about how other countries consume um, oil and natural gas and the associated products, and that'll have an effect on, uh, on the production of those resources. It also affects how we think about ourselves competitively, right? Are we being competitive in, in new energy technologies like electric vehicles or batteries? And a lot of the consumer pull from other developing economies will play a role uh, in how we compete uh, in, in the policies that those countries put in place to actually compete in, in creating those technologies will have an impact on the United States as well. Um, Total domestic energy consumption has plateaued over the last 15 years, and this rep represents a fundamentally new context for the United States. It is a far different thing to be able to create energy policy around an energy demand uh, a profile that is growing year over year. One that is not, it, it makes it much more difficult to be able to think about how to, one, change that energy system, and two, be competitive uh, relative to other fuel sources within the context of the domestic energy supply system. And so I think this is a really important point that many people uh, said had been overlooked in terms of the energy policy context uh, in the U.S. Um, 
Proposition number seven is booming U.S. energy production probably won't revive domestic manufacturing. Petrochemicals can be an exception to this because of the low price of feedstock. Um, but overall, when you look at sort of this promise of low, uh, sort of increasing energy production in the United States as a fundamental driver for resurgence in the manufacturing industry, it's a much more complicated picture than that, particularly for portions of the manufacturing industry for whom energy input is not, energy input costs are not a fundamental sort of uh, deterministic factor and where they locate uh, their plants relative to other things. Um, this was probably one of the more hotly uh, contested uh, uh, findings and discussions within the context of, uh, of this report. Um, Proposition 8 is that estimates of the number of jobs created by a particular energy project can be a, a flawed way of assessing their value. This is not to say that energy jobs uh, is an unimportant part of this conversation. In fact, it is the one issue, other than carbon pricing uh, policies, that made an appearance in, well, actually not the one, there's actually three of them, but that made an appearance in both of the workshops that we did. Energy jobs is an increasingly important part of the political and economic narrative around energy policy making. But the way in which we sort of adjudicate project by project basis, whether or not a, a energy policy or an energy investment is worth doing, is probably not a great way of assessing the societal value of that project. It's more complicated than that. Um, but there is real value in improving the way in which we track and understand energy jobs. It is a very complicated uh, uh, thing to do, but there are folks, and the Energy Futures Initiative was particularly helpful in uh, talking with us about this particular uh, set of policies. It is an important thing to do because it ends up being a relatively meaningful metric, um, particularly for, uh, for folks that are trying to invest in projects and things like that. We just need to be able to do it in a much more um, uh, uh, sort of um, fairly represented uh, basis. And then Proposition 9, I'm not going to go into this because we've got David Hart here, but innovation is very important, but oftentimes quantifying, quantifying and incenting innovation is really hard. Um, we just made that one really short because you're here, David, so you can tell us about why that is, uh, is or is not true. Uh, and then finally, on the system transformation and policy impacts part of the report, um, we had uh, four different sort of takeaways. One, contemporary energy um, modeling does not necessarily do a great job of showing nonlinearities in the energy system. This is definitely one of those takeaways that um, was uh, born out of the sort of e economist uh, conversation in the room, but it actually does have really important um, points for policymakers. Oftentimes, policymakers use these energy modeling outcomes to try and come up with precise conclusions. And, and they're not always good for deriving that kind of outcome or that kind of information. Oftentimes, these energy modeling uh, exercises uh, are really good at sort of pointing out directional things uh, and, and giving advice about sort of how to control for certain factors. But there's a lot about the way that the energy system is changing that doesn't get represented well in this. And, and Joe had some really good points on this, and so we'll hopefully get a little bit more into that in, the, in this discussion. Um, and then uh, there's a disproportionate focus on the cost of carbon reduction policies. Um, we had this really wonderful paper uh, that I think we'll talk a little bit about by Gib Metcalf from Tufts University as well about looking at the distributional impacts of various energy policies, whether it's regulation or uh, tax preferences or tax policies. And, and there, it's a very complex uh, sort of conversation about which policies are more regressive or progressive than others. How do you make uh, or sort of fix some of those policies so that they are uh, less regressive if that is what the impact is? But all in all, the, the sort of larger point here is that we have a lot of conversation about what the costs of some of these policies are, and not nearly as much conversation about what the cost of the impacts are of if, 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 you're, if you don't manage to sort of uh, achieve some of the outcomes of these policies, both in terms of avoided climate impacts, but also some of the other benefits that can come from uh, uh, energy-related policies like energy cost savings or uh, uh, creating new industries and a whole bunch of other things. So we actually wanted to just generally make the point that a lot of times when we're evaluating a certain cost of a policy, we aren't, one, talking enough about the distributional impacts of that policy, and two, not really thinking about the sort of you know, benefits of that policy uh, as well.
Um, then legacy energy infrastructure assets make it more difficult to transition. And this was a repeated and routine sort of thing in the conversation about the transition to a low carbon energy future, not only because in some instances you would want to prematurely retire capital uh, that is high carbon for a low carbon alternative, but also just because it's becoming harder and harder to build infrastructure in the United States period. Uh, and this was particularly a message we heard from a lot of folks in the energy industry uh, that it's really difficult to be able to build infrastructure regardless of what kind it is. And so figuring out ways in which you can, you can enable that to occur commensurate with the kinds of changes you might need to see, particularly in a low carbon scenario, is a really important area where we think more work needs to be done. Um, and then finally, the economic consequences of most energy policy is relatively minor in aggregate, but they're distributional consequences. I sort of went over that um, with the one about uh, uh, thinking about the, the uh, costs versus the impacts. So we have recommendations about what in each of these areas, either the academic community or the policy community should be focusing on to do more. I know many of you in the audience today actually do a lot of energy research and do a lot of this work. We would really love it for you to take a look at the report and to dig into areas where you think you can make contributions. Um, because we think that these are increasingly important areas for us to be um, creating public policies that can do a better job of satisfying the need to have energy policy um, uh, play a role in answering some of the economic uh, and social mobility questions associated with its development. This second report, and this is my last slide, the second report that, uh, that we, we've done and has just been released today, so we hope all of you will take a look, um, focuses less on sort of the macro picture about how, to, how the changes in the energy system and the choices we have about where we're going from here affect the economy at, at a national or a state or a local level, and looks more granularly about how do we evaluate the performance of certain policies that are designed to affect economic uh, uh, outputs from the energy sector at a, at a local level. And so we were thinking about, well, what does that mean? You know, how are um, energy policies running up against against economic development policies, and, and what impact are those having, and how good are those policies? And so what we did was we, uh, we looked at uh, uh, four different areas. One, jobs. Um, how well do we know how to create energy-related jobs, and, and what do we know about those jobs? Two, um, innovation, uh, particularly in the area of um, federal support for energy innovation that happens at a state and local level, particularly as it relates to innovation clusters. I know lots of people have thought about innovation clusters. Today we're going to talk a little bit about what we know about whether they are working or not. Um, and then three, uh, state and local government revenues. This is the point about whether or not state and local governments use energy-derived revenues in ways that create durable social economic uh, opportunity. And then finally, uh, uh, social and environmental justice. This was a new uh, topic area that was um, uh, we gave a lot of careful consideration into the report because um, we, we found that a lot of the ways in which we were talking about development of energy projects at a local level were starting to in, encounter much more a, a sort of um, engagement from social and environmental justice communities, which we think is an appropriate thing. And, and certainly looking at how, uh, how those, uh, those, uh, those communities and that engagement was changing the way we think about um, uh, executing on some of those policies and some of those projects. And so we have a, a section on the report that, that deals with that. We concluded that a lot of these areas are areas where there are a lot of uh, good ideas, but perhaps not a huge amount of, uh, of track record of great performance. Um, and so there's some real questions about how, if we, if we do prioritize economic development um, as it relates to energy policy at a state and local level, how do we get some of these policies or these programs to work better? And that's a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. Um, with uh, Joe and Mary Alice and Dave about, uh, about what they've contributed to the report and then also um, how we can think about the role that those kinds of policies play in the, in the sort of energy policy dialogue that we're having today. So um, thank you for listening to that. You should definitely go read the reports, but I want to sit down and have a conversation with, uh, um, with my colleagues now about some of the contributions that they made to the report. So, um, Yeah.
Okay. Um, so, Joe, thanks very much for being here. Um, one of the things that we had asked you to take a look at in um, in the first paper was the role that um, uh, that carbon pricing plays in the transition to a low carbon future. And interestingly enough, in just asking that question, I think you were able to highlight a lot of the uncertainties about that pathway in a low carbon transition. So could you talk to us a little bit about some of the findings um, and, the, and the contributions that you made in your paper to the first report? Sure. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah. It's great to be here. Uh, thanks to you and your colleagues for organizing this. Uh, so in addressing the question of what are the economic implications of a low carbon future, I drew off of some of the economic modeling literature to understand what carbon pricing would mean for economic aggregates, but also to gain some insights about the distributional consequences of doing that. So in my work, I drew from a recent EIA analysis of a carbon tax uh, that started at $25 a ton and increases 5% uh, a year plus inflation. Uh, this is uh, similar to what a number of other models have evaluated in recent years, including a large exercise by the Stanford Energy Modeling Forum. And so I'll, I'll give you a few point estimates. Uh, as, as Sarah noted, you, you shouldn't take those point estimates to the bank. Uh, <laughs> but I think both the direction and the order of magnitude are robust a among a large set of models. And so the first is when we think about the macroeconomic effects, the aggregates of a carbon tax, what we find is, for the most part, that the impacts are quite negligible. And so to give you a sense of that is that, say, with a $25 a ton carbon tax economy wide increasing year after year, by 2030 we'd see uh, U.S. GDP about $50 billion less than it w would be otherwise. Okay, this is in an, an economy that right now is $20 trillion and growing is incredibly small. It's about what we produce in a day in America. When you look at the impacts on the labor market, they estimate about, on net, 80,000 fewer jobs in 2030 than what the economy would have otherwise. It's about what we produce in terms of net job creation in about two weeks during a typical month of economic expansion in the United States. You look at consumption, investment, again, the impacts are incredibly small. And so when you try to understand the economic impacts of a carbon price, it's really important to understand the distribution of those impacts. And so the Energy uh, Information Administration's model allows us to really dig in deeply to understand what are the impacts, distributional impacts within the energy sector. And so what we find is not surprisingly in a world with a carbon tax, renewables fare quite well. In the baseline, EIA shows continued renewables growth, but they show that if you impose this kind of carbon tax by 2030, you'd have about 60% more renewable power than you would have in its baseline. You'd have more natural gas. You'd have both more natural gas production in the U.S. and about 5% more natural gas consumption than what they currently forecast. The big hit, of course, is to coal. They find that at this carbon price trajectory, you'd see coal consumption in the U.S. down by nearly three quarters by the year 2030. Oil, in their model, doesn't really change much. No real impact in terms of oil production. It's being dictated globally, and in their analysis, they're not assuming any other carbon prices around the world. And they're finding U.S. oil consumption is only down a couple of percentage points relative to its baseline in 2030. And part of that reflects, I think, some of the limitations in the model on where there are opportunities for adjusting behavior uh, in response to a carbon price in transportation. And I'll return to that point in a few minutes. I think it's also important to think through, though, the distributional consequences when we think about the design of the carbon tax. One thing this model doesn't do, and in fact, many of these models that focus on macroeconomic aggregates don't do distribution well, although there are a few that are starting to understand the income distribution consequences of carbon pricing, is that you realize that the details of the design really matter for whether a policy to price carbon is progressive or regressive. I've often heard concerns that a carbon tax by raising energy prices would be regressive because low-income households consume more energy as a share of their budget than higher-income households. But it really depends on a couple of really important factors. One is the question of whether or not your income is primarily coming from, say, uh, price index transfers. Like many elderly who live on Social Security, if energy prices increase, their benefits adjust in response to the change in prices. It also depends on how you use the revenues. You give the revenues away to everybody on, say, a per capita basis through a dividend check, it actually ends up being quite progressive. In fact, some estimates suggesting that the bottom two-thirds of the income distribution is actually better off. They receive more in those checks than they would actually have to pay in higher prices because of a carbon tax 
but that's how we redistributed the money back to the economy. One way to think about this is to think about Social Security. The payroll tax, that financial Social Security, is regressive. But the benefits from Social Security are actually skewed to be quite progressive so that on net, the Social Security system is progressive. And so it's easily possible to design a carbon tax system that while the actual imposition of the tax, narrowly defined, is regressive, how you use those revenues can be so progressive that on net the program is progressive. I think it's also important when we think about the progressivity or regressivity of a carbon tax is to think about what the alternative policies might be. And as Sarah noted, our colleague Gib Metcalf from Tufts did some work thinking about that. Let me make a couple of comments based off of his work. First is that we see in a lot of our energy policy, whether it's subsidies for, say, renewable technologies or electric vehicles, that the households who benefit from those subsidies and claim them, claim them in tax credits when they file those taxes, are disproportionately wealthy. And in fact, a number of research papers have shown that the claiming of those subsidies tend to be fairly regressive. We've seen that some of our energy policies, some of our standards, tend to be regressive on net. Fuel economy standards often have an impact of raising the cost of cars. It actually translates into increasing the value in the used car market, a number of economic analyses have shown. And as a result, the lower income households who typically are not in the new car market, but the used car market, are actually made worse off because they can't buy a car when they need one. We've seen research that has evaluated building codes that actually has shown that residential building codes impose more cost and distort more the decisions of developers who are producing lower income houses or houses for a lower income market segment than those serving the higher income segments in the state of California. So I think it's very important when we think about a discussion of progressivity or regressivity of a carbon tax to first think about the design of the carbon tax and second to think about what's the counterfactual, what's the mix of policies that I might use in lieu of a carbon tax and whether they are progressive or regressive uh, on net. And let me conclude with a couple of comments that I think are, are important when we think about the uncertainties of wild cards in the design of carbon pricing policy and efforts to decarbonize the U.S. Uh, economy. First, of course, is going to be what the policy in practice looks like. I described briefly a carbon tax policy that is beautifully cost-effective. It's sending all these clear signals. The signals are known with certainty. There's no concern about a future Congress changing the policy. There's no uncertainty about innovation in this model. And, the, and the, the firms make all the right decisions in the model. And we know the real world doesn't work that way. Sometimes there is uncertainty about the policy. Sometimes there's a mix of policies that are overlapping that may affect the incentives for both how we deploy to te technologies and how we undertake innovation. Related to that is, of course, what are the incentives for innovation? A lot of these models don't do a really good job with innovation. And how we see innovation play out over time is going to be critical for how we think we're going to see carbon technologies evolve and are deployed. As I noted, these models tend to show large reductions in coal because it's fairly easy in the power sector to displace coal with natural gas and renewables. Much more dis difficult to dis displace uh, liquid petroleum fuels in the transportation sector. And the tax there is both a function of innovation and about some of the network externalities that sort of push against rapid transformation of the transportation sector. But the thing about network externalities is that they make it hard to, say, disrupt the current way in which we distribute liquid fuels and transportation, how we've historically distributed power over the transmission grid. But once you can sort of overcome the barriers to network externalities, and you get a new network come into place, it can actually dramatically lower the cost and you can see rapid trans transformation, whether it's distributed energy and how we power our homes and buildings, or whether it's in how we power our vehicles in the future. The last thing that I think is important when we think about sort of the future of climate change policy is actually providing some predictability to those who are making these decisions. Sometimes we've talked about the challenge of sort of certainty, and I'm not sure it's necessarily certainty because I think most people who are making decisions, whether it's in the business sector, on investment, or households making their family decisions, they just want to sort of understand sort of how things are likely to proceed and be able to predict how they're likely to proceed. And so I think that's going to be an important uh, uh, element of however we design the future mix of energy and climate policy. Do we make it predictable to those who are making decisions about what kind of investments to take today, how to change their behavior, how to think about inventing the next uh, technology that could change the way we produce or use energy. And so that's going to be a critical element in uh, the design of policy that will help enable this kind of transformation.
That's great. Thanks, Joe. Joe, I want to come back in just a little bit and talk to you uh, particularly about the focus that one of the reasons why we asked you to look at a carbon constrained future and what the economic implications are is that it does cause you to evaluate a lot of other energy policy in light of where you might want to go. But but you brought up innovation a few times. And so I want to turn to David real quick because uh, you played a big role in both of these conversations because innovation is not only an important factor in, as Joe said, enabling us to be able to do some of these energy transitions, particularly the ones relative to, to uh, reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions. But also, it, it's often thought of as a sort of, you know, a, a local economic development opportunity as well to, to have federal investment in the ener energy uh, innovation clusters or incentivizing energy innovation at a local level. Can you talk a little bit about your contributions to that discussion? Because I think they were very helpful in, in thinking about how we frame this issue of innovation at both of those levels. Sure. So thanks, Sarah, for um, including me in the project. And I just want to express my admiration for what you guys do here. Uh, I think CSIS is really one of the most important venues for bringing, bringing this conversation to the policy community and also, however inconclusive our results may be, <laughs> they're bringing the results of, of academic and scholarly research into the discussion. So, um, so thank you for that. Um, so I'm going to just talk a little bit about my contribution to the second workshop uh, first, which we at ITIF published as a short uh, standalone paper as well as contributing to this. Uh, broader workshop report, and it focuses on state and local clean energy-based economic development uh, strategies, some of which pull on the federal investment in research and development, uh, and some of which uh, don't. Most of it is about manufacturing, so it's the paper is not really about what you might think of as the core climate and energy policies that are in the discussion, like renewable portfolio standards. I'll mention those, um, but mostly it's about manufacturing and, and, and other uh, you might think of as foreign investments coming into states. So the frame here is to think about the state or, uh, or a city, kind of like we think about nations and international trade. Every economy needs to have imports, uh, exports, so it can buy what it wants uh, to imports. And most economic development strategies, whether they're built around clean energy or anything else, have this uh, purpose. Um, so I describe uh, five of these uh, in the paper. Um, and the first one is one that states and localities have been doing for a long time, and that is offering incentives to companies that they want to build uh, plants, that want to bring data centers, anything that brings ex uh, external investment to, uh, to the community. Um, and the uh, poster child for this is Tesla's Gigafactory, which is building batteries for its um, car plant. Um, and the factory is in Nevada. Uh, according to local press reports, Tesla received $1.2 billion uh, to build the factory. So Giga, it's a huge factory, so that's a lot of money uh, spread out over a long uh, time. Uh, but this is the standard policy, and um, we just had a, a delegation from a state visit us. They were here for a, a federally convened program with foreign, actually, uh, non-U.S. investors. And all these states and localities are competing to bring this kind of investment to their community. And clean energy is just one of many sectors where they do this. And from that point of view, it just sort of slots right into what uh, states and localities are already doing. So that's kind of a top-down version. Uh, a second uh, strategy is more of a bottom-up, and this comes to something that Sarah uh, mentioned, and that's to build new industries um, around new technologies. Um, so this is building spin-offs out of R&D facilities, uh, where you have a national lab, where you have a strong university. Uh, obviously, Silicon Valley is our most prominent example of this, but we've seen this in biotechnology, and now we see uh, places trying to build um, industries in the clean energy uh, field. So, for example, New York State has a very elaborate strategy to build an energy storage, especially a battery uh, industry. Um, and part of that is to build uh, out of their R&D centers and to try to bridge. So the federal government is very good at providing scientific funding research at, at universities. The federal investment usually doesn't necessarily take those new technologies and bring them to market. So New York State's strategy is to try to bridge that gap between research uh, and the market. Now, they're also offering incentives. So one important point that I make is that these strategies aren't mutually exclusive. Uh, it's easy to follow more or one. In fact, most states are following uh, more than one. And New York's uh, battery strategy and energy storage strategy does fall into that uh, category. Um, a third strategy is to do better or to kind of broaden out what you're already doing. So if you have a cluster of excellence, uh, to find related areas where you can take that expertise and capability and, and uh, move into sort of an adjacent area. 
So an example for that example of that in the clean energy area is in North Carolina, where they have a relatively strong electronics sector, and they've tried to develop now uh, electronics that apply to the energy uh, industry. So this new decarbonized sector that, um, that Joe was talking about in electricity, it's more distributed, less big centralized plants, more distributed energy, and that requires a lot of digital coordination. So there's going to be a demand for electronics. Uh, power electronics, which are the devices that move this electricity around. And North Carolina has begun to develop a manufacturing sector around that. So they had a strong electronics cluster, and now they've sort of broadened it out to include this smart, uh, smart grid thing. So that's three. The fourth strategy comes back to this, uh, these very broad uh, energy policies, such as renewable portfolio standards that states are uh, pursuing. Um, and here the idea is to substitute local resources for imported resources. So uh, just like a country, if we're spending less on oil abroad, um, we have more resources to use for other purposes here. Uh, states and cities can also think this way. If they're spending less of their money on external resources for energy, that gives them that, that, those resources to use for other purposes. Um, and renewables are often thought of as having this characteristic, right? So the sun is free, the wind is free, I don't have to pay for oil, I don't have to pay for coal. Um, and there is something to that logic, but you do have to pay for the devices that convert that energy that's free from nature into something useful. So you have to buy your solar panels somewhere, you have to buy your wind turbine somewhere. So it's not quite as simple as it seems, but it is um, a reasonable factor to consider. And it's especially true in places where that, ex inter or that imported energy is very expensive. So for instance, Hawaii is a great uh, place to look at for this. Uh, it's not an accident that they've uh, made a commitment to 100% renewable uh, electricity by 2045 because they have fantastic solar resources, they have fantastic wind resources, and also the price of getting fossil fuel to Hawaii is really expensive. Um, so there's an area where we can see this kind of substitution. Um, but as I mentioned, not necessarily true across, um, uh, across all states and localities because it depends on that balance between paying for the devices versus paying for the fuel uh, and devices if you're using uh, higher carbon uh, energy. And then the last one that I want to mention is the idea of using demand, local demand, to build local production. So the previous strategies that I talked about are all kind of from the supply side, right? We're going to bring in manufacturing plants, we're going to invest in R&D. Here we use local demand uh, to try to drive the creation of supply. Um, an example of this would be California's zero emission vehicle policy, which goes back to 1990. And it was uh, certainly an environmental policy, right? They wanted to cut local air pollution, More recently they wanted to cut uh, carbon pollution, but it was also an effort to try to bring the auto industry into California. And we can see that as kind of a success, right? Tesla is based there, so they have this battery factory in Nevada, but they assembled their cars in the Bay Area, Fremont, California. Um, but it did take 30 years, so this policy has been in place a long time. We don't know for sure if Tesla is going to be there forever. I guess you can place your own bets if you have some money to put into the Tesla stock. Uh, you can uh, uh, gamble on that. Um, so, um, so I think we don't, we don't know the answer on that, but it, it certainly does uh, take a long time. Um, so my last point, and here's where my, uh, my sympathy with the inconclusive uh, research comes in. I don't really try to evaluate these uh, policies, but I do think there are sort of a few pointers that come out at the end of the paper to offer some recommendations. Um, and this really draws on a much bigger body of literature, not about energy-based economic development, but about these economic development strategies you know, many, many places have tried to become the next Silicon Valley, and so far none of them have really uh, succeeded, although some have so, had some success in the area. Uh, so three, uh, three conclusions I'll just offer for you guys. Uh, one is it's easy to waste money, uh, especially on incentives. Um, so uh, all kinds of projects look great to the current governor, but it's the next governor that has to pay, pay the bills. Uh, second, I think slow and steady win, wins the race. Uh, economic development requires a lot of different assets, physical assets, human assets, institutional assets, and unfortunately there's not a good match between that sort of slow and steady approach and the political system in most uh, places. But uh, there's no question that you can't sort of will industries into existence overnight. They take, uh, they take time. Um, and the last was, it would be great if all of our levels of our system could work together a little bit better. So what we see are states and localities competing with one another, the federal government sort of sitting out and making Mary Alice a little comment on this. Um, so there are some ways that they might they might do better, and I think the clean energy area is one opportunity. That's great. Thanks, David. And I think um, 
this intersection between sort of clean energy economic development strategy, one other th thing I had forgotten to mention in, is that we actually had sort of economic development officers from different states participating in these workshops to understand how they viewed the energy sector as a component piece of their economic development strategy and in their very different experiences. I mean, I'll talk a little bit about that later, but they're very different experiences based on you know, the resources they have in their economy and, and I think the performance of their ability to attract new industry, industry and do clean energy economic development has been very different based on, on some of those things. But Mary Alice, I want to uh, uh, turn to you because I think one of the, the sort of overriding um, concerns for many places, particularly in, in sort of thinking about a low carbon transition is sort of a, making it a just transition and thinking about how you take communities that need either worker retraining or new economic opportunity and, and actually make that happen uh, and how well we've done that. So I remember when I reached out to you, you were like, I don't really do energy. And it was like, well, no, that's okay. We, we, we want to talk about, you know, what do you do to try and get workers from one industry sort of into another and, and, and how well have we done that. So maybe you could talk about some of the insights that you shared with us on your work. Sure, I'd be happy to and, and thank you for the opportunity to be here and participate in this discussion. I'm definitely learning a lot. Um, so it's all fascinating. And yes, I, my expertise is in the areas of workforce development and career and technical education and job training programs. And so where I sort of come into this conversation is what happened. You know, first of all, how do we prepare the energy workforce? And uh, what are our systems at the federal, state, and local level for doing that? And then how do we help communities that are on the, uh, on the sort of downside of either some sort of cycle or, on, or not even a cycle, but just um, uh, on the downside of some sort of more permanent change in, um, in how we consume energy and what do we, how do we help those communities and, and the workers in those communities? So I guess I'll just start, start with the sort of big picture at the very top. What my paper does, or what my yeah, contribution to this uh, volume does, is sort of provide an overview of our workforce development and career and technical education systems um, at the federal level in particular, and sort of talk through some of the different programs that we have. Um, I think our, our workforce development system and our job training system in particular in this country has a little bit of a reputation problem. There's often a general perception that we have many, many of these programs and that none of them work. And neither one of them is quite right. Um, we do have a lot of different programs, but we only fund a very few of them. So we really just have a, a handful of federal programs that are really designed to sort of prepare um, um, workers, uh, frontline workers in the energy sector and a lot of other sectors. And those are our Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act that is administered through our Department of Labor, our Career and Technical Education Act, which is administered through our uh, Department of Education, which is our largest vocational education program, and then our Higher Education Act. And these are the three primary systems that we use to train workers, um, and skilled workers, um, after high school. Um, and for the most part, I will say, um, those systems are also not um, of similar size to one another. The, our job training, our workforce development system, and our career and technical education systems are extremely small, and are high, you know, uh, they come in at about $2 billion for workforce development, $1 billion for career and technical education, and then we have our higher education system, which comes in at about, you know, bill, you know just the Pell Grant program alone is a $30 billion program. But, but our higher education system, of course, does much more than just train frontline workers. It educates people in the much longer Program. So we have sort of three big systems, though, that support the, the preparation of a workforce in, in energy jobs. And I will say, for the most part, it functions pretty well, right? And so for communities, for example, uh, that are sort of making investments and, and are um, in new types of, of, uh, in new types of, of uh, companies or, or energy, you know, new types of jobs, we have a system of community colleges and technical colleges that do, in fact, are quite responsive to what's happening in their local economy. And although we might hear things about, you know, um, skills gaps or, or shortages, and you know, you know, different companies or sectors are always complaining about these things. Overall, we have a very responsive system of over 2,000 community colleges that are exist in every community across America that really do pay very close attention to what's happening and have been very responsive to changes in the energy sector. I was at the U.S. Department of Labor, for example, during the big green jobs investment, and 
and at first that was a that was sort of a, a an investment that kind of got off to a bad start because there was a misunderstanding about the nature of the jobs and the nature of the skills and how that sector would develop but over time you saw the training and education community adapt to what were the skills needed and how that, you know, how to embed those into new kinds of programs, how to embed those into existing programs. Um, so again, I would just say overall, we have a we are fortunate in this country to have a very um, decentralized and responsive post-secondary education and training system that can meet the needs of evolving technologies, not always as fast as people want, but generally pretty well. But then the question is what to do with communities that really just sort of bottom out and lose a coal, you know, lose a coal mine or lose some sort of industry, or that go through really uh, sharp cycles um, of change. And, and what are our strategies for helping those communities? And there, I'd say we're not in a great position. Um, I don't. Um, that is a very difficult thing to do, and, and I would say our systems have still not figured out how to do that. So. Um, our job, re our history of job retraining, the evaluations of our job retraining programs generally show that, um, that, that, that they are on their own not particularly effective at helping people sort of get back, uh, get back into the economy. And that's true the, particularly the older the worker is and the less skilled the job from which they have been displaced is. So when you think about communities, for example, in the whole country where you had very good paying jobs that required only a high school diploma, um, those that, that retraining workers, um, particularly middle-aged workers in, that, in those communities can be very, very difficult. Um, in addition, often when you have these more isolated rural communities, when you, you have the, uh, the, the problem of a closed plant or a closed mine, you have the additional problem of where are the new jobs going to come from and for what are you training people? And again, that's where our workforce development and job training system simply isn't up, it can't do this work on, it, on its own. It has to be part of a sort of holistic and comprehensive strategy. So we know that when communities, when there is investment coming into communities or investments to be leveraged, things like sector strategies, which takes job training programs and sort of brings together a group of employers from a particular industry sectors and organizes them and talks to them about their skill needs and then develops programs in conjunction with them. And, and, and uh, that's a very effective way of retraining workers, right? Because it's a collective effort that really is well-timed with, uh, well-suited with the, with the needs of the local economy. The question is that when there are not those employers there, or when there is not that kind of economic activity, what to do. And, um, and again, there are no easy answers here, I would say. This is where we need to be thinking more about federal, state, and local partnerships, about how to revitalize communities, how to make sure you know, job training on its own is not going to be able to solve problems if there are, there are not new jobs coming in. Infrastructure investments, community benefits agreements need to be part of that strategy. So that's a, a space right now where I would say there's still a lot of uh, work to be done. Um, some states do it better than others. At the federal level, we do have things like national emergency grants and you know, the, the Department of Labor administers and uh, all sorts of things that sort of kick in, for example, when a plant closes or a mine closes. But these things are time limited. Mm -hmm. And what, I think what we've seen since the Great Recession is that they don't often last long enough to really put communities back on their feet. Um, some do, you know, and we have seen some communities really do that. But I think the communities in the energy sector have perhaps been some of the hardest to sort of come back from that. Um, and maybe you all understand that better than I do in terms of the, the particulars of that sector, um, as opposed to maybe some of the manufacturing sectors. Um, so again, I think um, we have a lot of work to do there. I think we know some things will make job training programs more effective than others. We have robust evaluation evidence of both our largest trade assistance program and our Workforce, uh, Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, that job training, when it's coupled with other services like career counseling, are more effective or like child care and transportation. This doesn't sound surprising, but you know, <laughs> the, the, the systems weren't designed to support child care or to support transportation necessarily, particularly you know, our um, career and technical education system. So those things are things that we can build into federal policy. They have been, I think, over the last, over the last decade. Um, there's a lot more attention to them. But the other just sort of big Thing to keep in mind is that these systems that are designed to respond to communities that are in distress, that have experienced sudden job loss, yes, again, are sort of 
what we call rapid response, and then they tend to rapidly go away. And we don't invest very much in these mm -hmm. programs compared to your, our European counterparts or our counterparts in other advanced economies. We invest very, very little in job training. Um, so I think what we need in, in job training and job retraining, and we invest very little in career and technical education generally as a standalone field. So I think thinking forward, the challenge is, is how do we create sort of a space where we're confident about increasing investments in our worker training programs because we know they can be effective because they are effectively connected to economic development strategies that will bring real jobs or strategies that will help people move to where the jobs are. I mean, that will be the last thing I say. Is like one of the big surprises since the Great Recession, I think, for, for folks working in the workforce development community is that people have not been as mobile as we thought they were. And a lot of our systems were sort of aimed at helping, like our Trade Assistance Act, which is one of our large federal programs that's designed to help workers who have been displaced due to the effects of trade. One of the sort of underlying principles of it is that people will move to new jobs yeah. and it provides support, moving assistance and things like that. And that has just been a really important lesson learned over the last decade is that Americans are less mobile than they were uh, decades before and, and less likely to move to new jobs and that's also true in, in energy affected communities. Mm -hmm. So we need to tweak our systems to think about why that is and what we do about it um, and how we, again, sort of for place-based folks who are not going to leave their communities, how do we create opportunities for them and embed skills training and education in a larger economic that's great. Thanks. Thank you. OK, so now you can see why this is a relatively large set of questions uh, for which I think the novelty we were trying to bring to this is put it all together. Because if you're a policymaker at a federal level or a state and local community, you don't get to just answer one of these questions. You have to answer all of them. And that is an increasingly complicated set of things to do. I want to, before opening it up for uh, questions uh, to engage uh, our, our guests and audience here today, I want to ask each of you to just reflect on how some of this is uh, being uh, talked about in contemporary uh, energy policy conversations. So for example, when we did this, there was not a lot of uh, conversation, when we launched this project, not a lot of conversations about the Green New Deal. Green New Deal is definitely a giant theme. Um, that does touch on a lot of these issues that we were investigating. Maybe to start with you, Joe. I mean, one of the one of the sort of interesting pieces here that touches on much of what you talked about is thinking about the way in which carbon pricing has trade-offs with other regulation and policy. And 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 you've talked about ways in which you can make um, the the sort of distributive impacts of a carbon tax or, or uh, carbon pricing policy uh, uh, less regressive. Or it, but but how should we think about the the sort of the the way in which we think about carbon pricing policies and a bunch of these other regulations mm -hmm. and, and what are the trade-offs that we should should consider? So, you know, I, I think the thing that's that's been great about the Green New Deals is created this kind of opportunity to discuss these issues. Yeah. It's laid out some very ambitious goals. It has been um, there, there there are much fewer details though on the implementation. Yeah. Uh, the Green New Deal resolution itself is silent on carbon pricing mm -hmm. as as a potential means to deliver on, uh, on these goals. I, I think a, an economy-wide economy carbon tax is quite an attractive way to try to drive the big reduction in emissions that we need that's called for in, uh, in the Green New Deal. Um, we have, it's, it's, it's a dramatic change in the way we've done energy and environmental policy in the past. You, you look across the Clean Air Act or energy bills, whether it's through regulations of power plants or appliance efficiency standards or fuel economy standards, they tend to be very much sectorial based. Uh, when you look at the way we subsidize technologies, they really are on a technology basis. Like we have one kind of tax credit for solar uh, and a different kind of tax credit for wind. Um, and, and so I, th I think the, the idea of taking something that is technology neutral and sector neutral is um, quite a different change from the way we've done things in the past. But I think that given the, the magnitude of the challenge, we need to, we need to take that path. Mm -hmm. now, now, what that means, though, of course, is that there's a lot of interest in whether it is using regulatory policies that we already have or expanding regulatory authorities. There's also the question about what the federal government does relative to what state and local governments are doing. Uh, we already have a number of states that have given up on Washington and are moving uh, well ahead of Washington. 
And so even if you got a national uh, a carbon pricing policy, it's not clear they would necessarily cede uh, uh, the policy ground. Um, I think there are some policies that when coupled with a carbon tax might actually make some sense. Mm -hmm. Certainly it makes sense to think about a role for innovation policy to complement what you see in terms of, of, of a carbon pricing policy. There may be specific cases where we feel like people don't have enough information to make good decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, they may be myopic in the way they make the decisions. We may want to think about designing policy that can help address some of those uh, concerns. But having said that, there's also the potential that we end up with having a kind of belt and suspenders approach that may, one, increase the cost for reducing our emissions, and two, may start to distort the distribution of the cost in ways that we may not actually aspire to when we think about designing, uh, designing this policy. So I think a lot of that's going to require, on, on a sort of a case-by-case -case basis, um, uh, further investigation and analysis to understand where there's complementarities and where there may be unnecessary overlap. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that I think is important when we think about the Green New Deals is I think one of the reasons why it, it, it got a lot of attention is that it was trying to broaden the scope of stakeholders who would be engaged in this exercise. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at the Green New Deal, we're focusing, because this is primarily an energy-oriented conversation, on sort of the green part. But there's some parts of it that are on healthcare, that are on uh, financing education, that's on insuring jobs. And one thing that I think is an appeal of, say, a carbon tax is that all those things cost money. And we're going to need to finance some of that. And it's not just going to be through deficit spending. And, and so that, I think, is when we think about how we use the value that's created out of a carbon tax, it can help deliver on some of these other goals if that's where we think uh, we need to go to get that kind of sufficient political coalition to actually move uh, public policy forward. So you see there may potentially be some complementarities between a carbon tax and other pillars of the Great New Deal. It's, it's very, it, I, I, I don't see why they would necessarily be uh, uh, out of step with each other. And, you know, as, as someone who used to work in government and we actually did count up the money and, and cared about <laughs> things like deficits, and maybe we'll care about deficits again in the future. Uh, it, it's nice to have a revenue source as well as um, as well as spending. Yeah, that's great. So, and David, uh, uh, similarly, innovation has uh, you can't go up to the hill today without finding someone who wants to talk about their innovation plan, particularly in the energy sector. Are they um, one? Is the conversation we're having about innovation sort of commensurate with the challenges that you see for the U.S. to be an innovative, you know, energy economy? And two, um, are people thinking about how that feeds into the sort of state and local dynamic? I was on the Hill testifying not too long ago, and you know, there's lots of conversation about incorporating state and local economic development and innovation opportunity with federal policy. But when you ask people what they meant by that there wasn't a lot of detail behind it. I mean, how do you reflect on that conversation? Yeah, well, the first thing I would say about it is it's about time. I mean, we've been beating this drum for a long time and it's exciting to hear card-carrying economists, you know, bring it into the conversation. Uh, so Bill Nordhaus, who won the Nobel Prize for his work on carbon pricing, once said, you know, to a first approximation, the solution to climate change is carbon price, everything else is fluff. So, um, so I'm glad to hear that that's not the case because obviously carbon price can do a lot, but it can't do everything. And, as, as Joe's remarks suggested, certain sectors, transportation sector, but also the industrial sector, the agriculture sector, these are all important sources of carbon emissions, uh, not just in the U.S., but even more so globally. And remember, this is a global problem. We have to have global solutions. We're going to need innovation to address those uh, challenges. So it's very exciting to have this uh, conversation. I also think it's important that um, it's there was a time, I think, under the George W. Bush administration that innovation was perceived as a way to do nothing. Like, we're going to talk about innovation, but not actually do anything. That's still, I think, something of a challenge. But I think on the, on the left side of the spectrum, if you look at the various plans that have been offered by the presidential candidates, there's a healthy commitment to innovation in those plans. Um, and, and on the Hill, you know, it's the Republicans who responded to the Green New Deal by talking about innovation. So there's... The Venn diagrams don't overlap in this area a whole lot, but that's one area, and maybe carbon pricing will see is another. Um, so there's an opportunity to get um, something done. I don't think it's all that well coordinated with the state and local level, and that's a piece that would need to be uh, filled in. And I think I think we've focused on this um, to a great extent through the environmental policy lens, but we're going to need to add the economic development lens 
more um, strongly to build popular support and also to address, as some of your bullet points uh, noted, the competition that's arising in the rest of the world. So um, uh, electric vehicles and batteries are probably the most prominent example. We are, we are behind the curve. This is our biggest manufacturing sector. Um, if the Green New Deal was realized, you know, we might just wipe out the auto sector in America. It's a little bit too you know, strong. Uh, but certainly, we're talking about a rapid transformation into an industry where we have very little capability at the moment. So I think there's a need to bring those things together. I think Congress is a great place to do that because that's where state and local interests can have their uh, strongest expression. And, and I would expect more of this to be realized. Yeah. And Mary Alice, I want to go a little bit different with you. you. You did talk a little bit about sort of how we've been thinking about and how the policy community is thinking about improving workforce development. What about, um, and, and, and thank you very much for pointing out the sort of labor mobility issue, which was one of the big things that we talked about in the workshop, which is like, you can't just sort of find jobs for people. You have to make their communities whole because that's where they want to live. And that's a very different kind of economic development strategy. What about the role of companies, particularly energy companies, in, in solving either end of this problem about giving themselves a proper workforce or thinking about transitioning people in their workforce to other fields? What kind of a role do they play? Yeah, I mean, I think they, they, we would like them to play a really central role in that. And, um, and again, there's ways to use public policy to sort of create the right incentives for them to, to do that. But, um, you know, the more companies are sort of actively involved in, in, in training their workers and in, in sort of creating sort of local talent pipelines, the more healthy and resilient those tend to be. We do a lot of work on apprenticeship. Uh, the energy sector actually uses, uh, energy employers use a, apprenticeship quite a bit. It's a, it's a wonderful education and training model. We'd like to see more of it in these sort of new and emerging sectors as well. Um, you know, and that's something I, I think the right kinds of incentives can be built into public policy to reward companies for using those kinds of strategies. But yes, employers, um, you know, we, we sometimes, it varies, but in, in some, some communities and in some sectors, there's a sort of sense that companies are on the receiving end, that they're the consumers of workforce development or the consumers of higher education. And that's just, um, you know, it, it's, not a, it's not a good relationship because we end up with producing a lot of, of uh, you know, uh, sort of over, it's a very inefficient way of producing skilled workers where colleges and, and other training providers are sort of guessing at, at what folks want. Um, so I do think there's a lot of um, interest right now with unemployment so low, this is a perfect time to be building those systems that really embed employers into some of these new um, you know, solutions and investments. Um, this is the time to do it, not when unemployment goes up. And that's a lot of what we're thinking about with the apprenticeship work in particular. Things like apprenticeship and company training systems in general have high startup costs. They take time for companies to build. Um, and um, but once they're there, they generally produce a pretty strong return on investment for the companies. It's a better way to recruit, train, and retain their workers. Um, so yeah, now is the time to sort of do that. That's great. Okay, I want to invite all of you to get into the discussion. If you'd like to, please uh, raise your hand uh, and state your name and affiliation. Ask a question in the form of a question, and wait for the mic. We'll I'll start with Bill up here. Manja, right in the front row. Hi, thanks, Bill Hederman, University of Pennsylvania and CSIS, and thanks for your remarks. Uh, I'm wondering about what you found and what we need in terms of the premise, I think, of energy and environmental policy going forward is constant, rapid innovation. And uh, we look at the coal industry case, and in my mind, I'd like to understand whether it was unique and uniquely resistant, or it's what we're going to run into constantly. And coal communities are intentionally, were always intentionally isolated, captured workforce, and you know, so now you're seeing those folks aren't willing to move. But I recall like one uh, survey of Indiana coal miners who you know, are less in a way connected just to the coal industry and not one of the miners wanted their children to go in the industry. So uh, how do you deal with that? Or, or is the coal problem unique and uniquely unfortunate and 
we have to find another way to deal with that and do other things to encourage innovation that we're going to need going forward. I'm wondering if you got any insights on that. Yeah. Anyone want to comment on that? Well, I'll give it a shot. I mean, I, I think what Mary Alice is talking about actually is the critical piece. And, and as you mentioned, is it like one tenth? I mean, our spending and training and retraining is a tiny fraction of what other countries do. And this is not specific to energy. This is a broader economic challenge for the country to have the kind of flexible and, and mobile workforce, you know, to, you know, for two reasons. One is to provide the workers into the new sectors. But second, is to uh, address these pockets of political resistance, which manifest themselves in our system more so than systems that are organized around national elections. Right? Our, even our national elections are state and local. So, um, so I think that's a big uh, part of it is to is to facilitate that mobility. I don't know for sure whether coal is an extreme case. You know, it's very interesting the way you described it, and, and that suggests that it is a more extreme case because these are remote communities. Uh, but I think this question of mobility and um, you know, is it because of housing prices? I mean, clearly, you know, when your whole community tanks, then how can you move to Washington, D.C.? I mean, it's just not practical. So we're going to have to find ways to, to deal with that. So, so the, the two things I want to emphasize on this is that when we think about innovation, we need innovation policy and we need strong climate policy. I prefer a carbon pricing policy, but, but, but we need both. And sometimes in the conversation there is, whether it is Professor Nordhaus saying just focus on the carbon pricing, but sometimes there are people who say, we're going to innovate our way out of the problem. But we're going to need to have, I think, both strong economic incentives to create a demand for innovative technologies in the energy system, as well as policies that are pushing on the innovation dimension. And, and I would say when we look back over the last 20 years, we've seen an incredible out incredible amount of innovation, whether it's in driving down the prices of solar panels, driving down the price of extracting natural gas, driving down the cost of wind. There hasn't been a lot of innovation in coal in a long time. You know, so it's one of these things where, you know, where there was an opportunity potentially, and it may come back. I mean, if we can ever make carbon capture and storage technology work, that's, that's the innovation that, that enables coal to continue. But I remember more than a decade ago working on these issues and people thought we were about to make CCS commercial. And so far what we've shown is that it's really, really hard and expensive technology. Mm -hmm. And so it may be that there's just some parts of, of, of the industry and the economy that are not going to be there going forward. And we've seen that in other parts of the US economy over the last two centuries. And, and the challenge then is how we think about designing the policy to address those communities where it is very difficult. Uh, to adjust and to deal with the new realities of where yeah, I think economic demand and economic activity is evolving. Mm -hmm. Can I just add one, just to say one thing, I, I, don't, I don't know if coal is, especially, you know, uh, from an energy standpoint, but what I would say is that we, we have seen that other communities that aren't quite as isolated, like manufacturing communities that were really negatively affected in the recession, have been able, some of them have been able to come back. And, and I think if we think about sort of an innovation economy that is constantly changing, we are going to need to think about systems that take mid-career workers that maybe aren't bachelor degree yet, right, and sort of put a floor under them and, and a combination of training, but also things like wage insurance, better uh, unemployment insurance policies, and then, of course, economic development policies. But, but it's that group of workers who are somewhere between, you know, 30 and 50, um, I think is going to continue you know, outside of coal communities, but in like the communities you're talking about in Indiana, where we need to we need to stri strengthen our supports for them, and I do think that we can have effective strategies for helping them transition into new, to new jobs. That's great. Uh, like Sarah, can I just one quick remark on uh, on David's? Uh, when, when I was in uh, Berlin for Ernie Moniz, the the other issue that came up there was the guarantees and support for the coal workers. Uh, created a situation where the entrepreneurs were hesitant to make hires because it was had to be a hire for life. Mm. So, um, can I see a show of hands? We have a lot of questions, so I may collect <laughs> them. Okay, let's do the three up front here, and then we'll do the three down the side. So, Manja, if you come over here, Karen St. John right there. And w let's collect them, okay? Sure. Uh, thank you. I agree, David. I, I think the key link is all the stuff that Mary is talking about right now. Because right now you have a lot of people, a lot of them in the middle of the country, who feel that they are not benefiting. 
and that you've got the two coasts who are, and yes, you can promote your clean energy and green economy, and the two coasts do well, but a bunch of people in the middle don't. And so I think it's, and it has political implications, because those people vote. So until we crack that nut, in terms of how do we address this holistically, we're going to remain in political gridlock. Thank you. We're going to pass it right there to the gentleman. Andre, right here. Can you raise your hand, sir? Thanks. Hi, um, my name is Don Cayley. I'm a columnist for a newspaper back in Eugene, Oregon. Um, I want to play on uh, uh, Mary Alice's um, just phrase of putting a floor under people. And I wonder if, and also Joe's talk about how to make sure things are properly uh, 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 progressive and, uh, and, and, and social justice issues. Would Andrew Yang's um, um, universal basic income um, be a, a shorter, a more elegant solution to some of this? And did it come up in any of the discussions that you had at, as you pursued all of the complexity of this? Great. And then can you, um, right here, James. Yes. Hi. Uh, I'm uh, James Cohn from IHS Market and proud former CSIS intern. <laughs> uh, and, uh, I have a question mostly for Dr. Aldi. Uh, so I understand uh, rebates from a carbon tax, and if they're given back on a per capita basis, uh, they, they're good on, on an income distribution uh, metric. But I'm just wondering about the quantity of energy used depending on the geography. So in suburban and rural areas, probably there's more energy used, and what proposals are to address that kind of difference. Um, maybe, so we've got essentially sort of two questions here. One, actually, we spent a huge amount of time talking about uh, it, it, both of these, which is uh, more on the sort of second workshop, which is what is the relationship between sort of the New Deal side of the ledger of policies and the green side of the ledger of policies, and how should those two things interact with one another? And I think the broad conclusion that we came to was there's a lot that's being put on the energy policy side of the equation that actually belongs in sort of a more... Uh, we need more sort of social support systems to help people through transitions because energy policy alone can't deliver those things. And so it would actually be helpful if we had much more developed conversations on the other side of the ledger and thought about the interaction between those two things. So I'll just add that and then you guys can add to it too. And then the question, uh, the mm -hmm. James's question. So anyone want to talk about the first one? Um, so I guess what I find really striking is the way energy politics and policy in America used to be very regional. Mm -hmm. um, and it's obvious different places have different energy resources and different preferences to some degree. So you would think that that would characterize it. But what we've seen in recent years has become highly partisan. So um, if you take the Midwest, where in, well, this is true, wherever the governorship switched in the last election, those people have put you know, pretty strong climate policies and energy policies in place. Now, there are some differences that do reflect regional differences. Um, but I, I don't think it's fair to say that the sort of the middle of the country has as opposed to um, stronger climate policy, I think it's highly polarized, um, and so, um, so, so, some way we have to build a bipartisan, I think, broad bipartisan consensus if we're going to get this thing, you know, in place and make it predictable and last for 30 years. So we can empower investors to make, um, you know, investments that are going to last uh, a long time. But I do think it's important that people believe that this new economy is something that they want to be part of. Um, we can't see it as sort of we're going to take our lumps. You know, the future is going to be worse. We just have to put up with it. That is not going to bring this consensus about. So, and I do think there is uh, in certain communities more. And it's not just um, it's not just you know uh, working class white people. It's also uh, you know diverse communities of all kinds that see themselves as potentially worse off. So we have to find a way to convey a vision that these people want to be part of, um, that they can see their kids in. And uh, you know the Green New Deal is an exciting framing for that for some people, um, and I think we need more discussions on that level as well as on the nitty gritty that most of us here in DC spend. Yeah, yeah, and I guess I would just add on the. I mean, Oregon is certainly at ground zero right now <laughs> of, uh, of the kinds of, of you know uh, tensions and polarizations that can arise as a result of uh, uh, climate change uh, um, legislation, but. I do think I would just 
double down on what Sarah's saying. I mean, I think overall, you know, we think a lot about the effects of automation and manufacturing and, 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 and the effects of automation in retail. And in general, we are going to, if, if we're going to embrace innovation and we're going to embrace technology, then we need to recognize that we need systems to, 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 to give people more supports. I am not a big fan of universal basic income because I don't think idling people is, is the best solution. And I think there are so many, there's so much work that we could be doing, just the care economy alone and how much how much better it could be and how we could, subs how we could fund it differently so that people have meaningful work um, in the care economy that is also provides them with a meaningful li living, you know, and, and different ways of using some of those resources that people are talking about in UBI to make certain kinds of work uh, pay, I think is something I would be more, more interested in doing. But in general, I think this is all part of a larger conversation of how do we build an innovation economy that takes care of people who get caught in the middle of their life and have to make a big change. Mm -hmm. so, so to this uh, final question, I, th I think there's two ways to sort of think about what's the economic incidence uh, that would arise from a carbon tax. Part of it is your direct consumption of fossil fuel energy, whether it's in electricity or transportation fuels or to heat your home. And part of it is in your consumption of everything else that has energy uh, that is part of the manufacturing and the shipping of that. And, and so the thing is, is that the, the, the regional disparities show up more when we think about that direct consumption. You know, if, you, if you're living in Washington state, your electricity is basically zero carbon. And if you're living in, say, the state of Ohio, it's much higher in its carbon content. Our, the, the nature of our consumption tends to sort of smooth out these regional differences. And some of the research has shown is that we probably would see more of the carbon tax uh, so sort of spread out, spread out over that sort of ninety percent of your consumption, that is based off of what you buy from other parts of the country, or even other parts of the world, then that sort of ten percent that is much more regional or local in its carbon content because it's the direct energy you consume, and so you may be seeing differences regionally that may be on the order of say a couple hundred dollars a year between sort of low and high carbon consumers, both based off their electricity consumption and what's the typical sort of driving characteristics uh, of people in those different regions. Um, that's, that's actually smaller than, that. overall that ends up being smaller than sort of what's the carbon impact that you face over all your consumption. So if you're recycling all those revenues in a, like I'm not gonna, I'm not making any tough decisions here because the tough decisions create a political mess. You know, there, there's something very simple and transparent about every person gets the same check every three months, mm -hmm. right? And as soon as we start saying, I'm gonna target one way or another, um, I think it, it creates a, a lot of political challenges. Now you may carve out s some money that I think you could say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna target vulnerable communities. You may carve out a little bit of money that says I'm gonna do more on innovation, but how we return the vast majority of the money, there's something quite appealing, I think, to saying everybody gets the same check. And we're not going to fight over how I'm going to tweak this part of the tax code or that part of the tax code, because anytime you get into tax code reform fights, uh, they last three or four decades. <laughs> um, on that note, I, we're actually going to um, uh, uh, thank our panelists for uh, for being here today. I want to just say a couple of things. One. Um, this is the start of a discussion for us. We actually think it's a fairly transformative time for both the energy policy agenda, how we think about the role of energy in the US economy, both as a domestic affair, but also our competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis other countries around the world, and the kind of economic insecurity and inequality issues that are increasingly important for us to be focusing on provides a lot of really interesting perspectives for this discussion. We hope all of you will take a look at the report, engage with us on the research that you're doing in this area. We'll be engaging with policymakers again in this, this fall to sort of talk further about what the implications of some of these issues are. But I just want to say, um, one, a huge thanks to my colleague, Jesse Barnett, who did most of the behind the scenes work on writing a lot of uh, all of this input that we've gotten in just sort of a coherent report. And so he's to be commended for, for that effort. Uh, and then also uh, for our colleagues today here for joining us for this discussion. Thank you so much for helping us scratch the surface on this. Thank you, sir.